aquí en el instituto, el doctor Bernardo Santos. Ya lo había mencionado Jorge en la presentación pasada. Eh, Bernardo eh, estudió su licenciatura en la Universidad Federal de Espíritu Santo, eh, doctorado en el American Museum en Nueva York y dos postdoctorados en, en el Instituto Smithsoniano. Y bueno, es un, es un gran gusto tener aquí Bernardo. Bernardo es, es eh, como lo vieron en su charla pasada, es un taxónomo especialista en, en un grupo de, 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 de avispas parasitoides de ignomónide pero además de ser un buen taxónomo, eh, se interesa por diversas, responder diversas preguntas de, de tipo evolutivo con su grupo de estudio. Y ya desde hace algunos años está muy interesado en, en, en realizar estudios que tienen que ver con la domesticación de virus por parte de avispas parasitoides, en este caso con su grupo de estudio con las avispas parasitoides de la familia Dimonide. Entonces, bueno, eh, sin más preámbulos, eh, damos la bienvenida a Bernardo. Gracias, Bernardo. Ótimo, muchas gracias, Alejandro. Bien, hacemos como la vez pasada, yo hablo en inglés, pero si tienen preguntas en español, le puedo dar de mi uh, uh, y mejor. Well, so if you're not tired of my face yet, um, oops. What's happening? Is it me? Oops. No. So it's supposed to be here. Okay. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> okay. So yeah, I'm going to talk a little bit today about um, um, a project or maybe a series of projects in which I've been working that focus on um, viruses, um, uh, on viruses that are associated with parasitic wasps. This is a system that is not very well known. It's pretty interesting and mysterious. So I'm going to do some kind of introduction work first. Um, this doesn't, not working. Okay, there we go. So um, just before, uh, let me uh, explain that uh, all of this work here is uh, collaborative work done um, with the help of my uh, former supervisor, uh, postdoc for the supervisor at the Smithsonian, Sean Brady, uh, bioinformatics specialist, Rebecca Dico, and also uh, uh, some colleagues in France, uh, and Nathalie Volkov, uh, Fabrice Leger, and Stéphanie uh, Robin, who work at uh, INHA, which is an agriculture research um, institute in France. Um, so we, yes, uh, on Tuesday, we talked a lot about parasitic wasps, which you know all about at this point. So, um, and we discussed as well how many parasitic wasps will lay eggs in a host that will keep um, feeding and developing after it's been parasitized. Um, that's what we call coinobiont parasitoids. Um, so in those cases, of course, the wasp has to deal with the immune system of the host, um, which can, you know, encapsulate uh, and kill the, the, the wasp egg because it's inside of the, the host body. And so the, the host has several um, defense cells called hem uh, hemocytes that can congregate around the wasp egg and kill it and so forth. And so the wasps also needs um, uh, proteins and, and compounds that will help destroy or disable this immune system so that the larva of the wasp can um, successfully develop. And one of the coolest strategies that um, have been developed by parasitic wasps are what we call domesticated viral elements or endogenous viral elements which are um, genes of viral origin that are integrated into the wasp DNA. That is, um, at some time ago, um, an event occurred in which virus, the viruses that were in the body of the wasp became so closely associated with that wasp that um, they integrated, they got integrated into the wasp genome. And so, um, and so nowadays they are produced inside of the ovaries of the wasps um, clipped out, they're produced from the, the, the wasp genome, clipped out and injected in along with the egg by the wasp into the host, right? So that's what we call, that's why we, we call this like a domestication process in the, in, in the sense that the virus got so um, uh, deeply associated with the wasp that it depends on the wasp for its um, uh, replication. And also it's used by the wasp to, to benefit its, its progeny. And so this is a pretty unique system if you think about it, because we are used to thinking about viruses 
like this, right? A life cycle like this. A virus infects a host, which enables it to produce more viruses, which in turn uh, infect a new host and so forth. But here, the viruses in the wasp, they don't replicate in the host of the wasp. They only, they only express genes. So the only way that the, these viruses are passed on to the next generation is from the genome of the wasp itself. So what we have here is a wasp that produces a virus that infects a host, which on its turn makes the wasp make a new wasp, which will infect a virus and a host. So it's a to totally different life cycle from, from normal viruses, so to speak. Um, and so as a consequence, of course, this is very, has very interesting evolutionary you know, questions that we can ask about this system. We, we think about how this association occurred in the first place because it's just so unique. And what's craziest about it is that it didn't occur only once. We have pretty good evidence that DVEs, um, domesticated viral elements, evolved several times um, within parasitic wasps, parasitoid wasps. And there's a number of um, different lines of evidence to, to, to suggest this. One of them is um, the structure and function of these viral elements themselves. So for example, we have two very different types of um, domesticated viral elements that we find in parasitic wasps. One is what we call polyDNA viruses or polydna viruses, which are um, viruses, uh, viral particles that contain several um, large DNA uh, segments. So they, they're like individual uh, fragments of circular DNA inside of the viral particle, right? And so um, it has multiple uh, DNA molecules that in, will encode what we call virulence proteins, uh, which uh, are the, the proteins that help uh, the wasp to destroy the immune system of the host or to disable the immune system of the, of the host. So it's a, a kind of like more or less standard viral particle in the sense that it's a viral envelope with DNA inside. But we also have what we call the virus-like particles, which are um, molecules that look like viruses. They resemble viruses. They have a viral envelope, but they have no DNA in inside. So instead of having um, DNA, they have the, the virulence proteins themselves already produced, and they act more of a like a delivery system for those for those um, proteins. They infect the viral the, the host cells and then deliver those proteins directly. So it's just two very different mechanisms of of um, uh, of using uh, domesticated viral elements. Um, and the second line of evidence that we have for this is the wasp phylogeny itself, uh, in the sense that we, we find um, uh, domesticated viral elements in several independent lineages of wasps, right? If we had one single lineage or a group of species that were all related to each other, we could say that this only evolved once. But we, what we see here is that we have several different instances of independent acquisition of um, viral elements. So we have um, Leptopilina boulardii, which is a fidgeted wasp that has a filamentous virus that is associated with it. We have um, one uh, group, or it was a small group of braconids that also evolved association with the virus. Then we have a huge group of another group of braconids uh, called the microgastroid complex. These are all parasitoids of caterpillars. And all of the members in this huge group with thousands of species have um, a specific kind of uh, DVE. And we also find DVEs in the best family of Hymenoptera, the Ichneumonidae. Um, and this is kind of like the group that I'm interested in for systematics and evolutionary biology purposes. So it's been the group that I've been studying um, in terms of their association with the, with DVEs. Um, and with ichne within ichneumonids, we find also these two kinds of DVEs. We find um, polydna viruses, um, which we call when they're in ichneumonids, we call ichnoviruses. Not not so creative, but it will do. Um, and ichnoviruses are found in two different subfamilies, the Campoplegine, that has uh, over 2,000 described species, and the Bankine, which has over 1,700 species. Uh, so these, as we, I was saying, are polydnaviruses, that is the uh, viral package with um, lots of DNA inside. But we also find virus-like particles, at least in one species. So far in published record, we only know it from one species, Venturia canescens, which is also a Campoplegine, um, but it doesn't have PDVs. So we have polydnaviruses in most Campoplegini, but we don't have them in Venturia. Instead, Venturia has a virus-like particle that is uh, a viral particle with no DNA that delivers protein directly to the host. 
And of course, you know, as I was saying, this is all very interesting from an evolutionary point of view. We, we can ask ourselves lots of interesting questions about how these systems evolved in the first place, what kind of viruses were used by the wasps to, um, um, to recruit them to domesticate, to incorporate into their um, attack against the immune system of the host. When different kinds of viruses are recruited, does that have impact on the evolutionary trajectory of that lineage? Um, how is this viral DNA incorporated into the wasp genome? Is it all in one place or is it spread out in several places? Um, and what kinds of um, genetic features are conserved or diverge um, across different wasps and, and their different um, viral associations. So for example, we know quite a bit more about uh, the viruses that we find in braconids than, than what we see in eucumonids. So the polydnoviruses found in braconids in the microgastroid complex, they are called the bra bracoviruses. Um, and uh, lots of very good work has been, has been done on bracoviruses, um, sequencing the whole genome of braconid uh, wasps and finding, locating the, where the, the, the viral genome is. So we know, for example, that viral, segment, uh, viral segments of bracoviruses are found in, in braconids in eight clusters or replication units, um, that they have excision motifs that control uh, how these um, the viral segments are going to be clipped out of the, of the uh, wasp genome into, into viral packages. So structurally, they're, they're fairly well known. And it's also known that the bracoviruses, they um, evolved from a specific group of viruses called the nudiviruses. So uh, in addition to the, um, the genome, the, the, the DNA molecules that are packaged inside of the virus particle, we also find within the wasp um, uh, genes that are remains from the ancestral uh, ancestral virus genes that were used to replicate to, to replicate the, the, the virus. So that's what we call the viral machinery, right? So these are DNA uh, are genes that they have a role in the replication of the virus, but they don't get packaged into that particle that is delivered to the host. Because remember, as we were discussing, the once the virus is injected into the into the host, it doesn't replicate anymore. It only replicates in the wasp ovaries. So when it's delivered into the host, it only expresses proteins. So these genes, ironically, the genes that control the replication of the virus, they are not in the final viral particle. Uh, and so this is what we call the viral machinery. And these, because these are derived from the genes that um, replicate the viruses, these are often the best um, the best viruses to the, the best genes to indicate the origin of these viruses from which viruses these uh, viral particles derive. And in bracoviruses, it was shown that um, uh, here is a kind of like a phylogeny of different groups of viruses. Here you see three kinds of bracoviruses, and you see that they're nested within a larger group that's called nudiviruses, right? So their bracoviruses are actually a kind of derived nudivirus. And you know, studies of phylogeny of the group of uh, braconids also shown that um, this happened as a single integration event uh, in the microgastroid complex over 100 million years ago. So it's just an association that goes a long time and has been um, and has been passed on up to thousands of, of species that occur today. Um, in ichnoviruses, we know a lot less, you know, because less research has been done on the group. So. Um, we know, for example, that they also have a replication machinery that is um, separate from the package genome. So these genes association associated with the replication of the virus that um, don't get packaged into the final viral particle. And in ichnomonids, we call them ISPERS, ichnovirus structural protein encoding regions. Um, What's interesting is that while uh, my colleague uh, and Natalie Volkov and collaborators have found these genes and identified them and know and, and identify them as the, the regions responsible for the viral replication. After sequencing them, they are not similar to any known viruses. So it's at this point, we don't know where ichnoviruses come from and in the sense that from which group of viruses they were originally modified because they don't look like any viruses that humanity knows. They could be a group of derived from a group of viruses that um, we haven't found yet in the wild or from a group of viruses that is today extinct. But it's so it's they're very mysterious um, viruses. And in terms of um, 
the, the genomes of polyDNA viruses. So just recapping what I was just explaining, we have virulence, virulence genes, which are the genes that are injected uh, by the wasp into the host. They are packaged into the virus particle uh, and they are the, the viruses that the, the genes that produce the proteins that will destroy the immune system of the host. And we have good indication that many of these at least are of a wasp origin. That is, they were originally wasp genes that were repurposed to be put into the viral particle. And, um, and we have replication genes or the viral machinery that the, the genes that control the production of the virus, they're not packaged into the viral particle and they likely, and they originate from the ancestral virus and therefore they're really good um, indicators of uh, what these original viruses were. So um, the first project I worked on with um, polydna viruses was a project in which I was interested in um, understanding the genomic architecture of ichnoviruses. So to, together with my colleagues in, in the US and in France, we sequenced the, the genome for two species of Campoplegine in the same subfamily, Campoledis sonorensis and Hypozoder didymater, one, of the, one from the, uh, North America, one from Europe. Um, they're both, um, they're both uh, Campoplegine, which were known before to have the, 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 the virus. So the virus for both of these had been isolated from the, um, from the ovaries and then sequence like we knew we knew the viral the, the genome of the virus the package genome of the virus before so, but we wanted to understand how it was distributed into the wasp genome right um so what we did was uh we did um illumina sequencing at very high coverage for both of these we used some we didn't use any long read technology um for them but we used some um, library prep techniques that allowed us to generate more complete assemblies so for hypozoder did matter my colleagues did um, made pair libraries um uh, and for the campylidis sonorensis we used the 10x chromium which is also a technology of library prep that helps you get better assemblies um and um yeah so you know, our goal here was to understand how are viral insertions distributed into the eukimonid genome? That is, are they all in one single piece? Are they spread out across the genome? Is the genomic architecture conserved across the two species? Is there a difference between what we see in the proviral genes, that is the virulence genes, the genes that attack the immune system of the host versus the viral machinery? So, you know, we got pretty decent um, uh, assemblies, even though we were only using short read technology. Um, our, uh, the size of our assemblies uh, and level of completeness was on par with other um, genome sequencing projects for other parasitoid wasps. So it's more or less the same size of genome. Uh, we had some pretty long um, scaffolds, some really long fragments of the DNA after the assembly of the genome, which allowed us to really have a good sense of where these viral insertions were placed. Um, also, uh, an, a common technique to verify if the genome you sequenced is really complete or not is to use buscos. These are benchmark universal single ortholog genes. That is, these are single copy orthologs. These are genes that we know, for example, there's a set of 3000 buscos or so. There are genes that are found in every single insect. And so what we do is that we get our genome. We don't know if it's complete or not, but we look for these 3000 genes and see how many of them we get in our, in our genome. If we got 100% of them, it's a pretty good indication that our genomes are complete because they have all of the genes that they have should have. But if we only have five, find 50% of the genes that should be in every insect, that means that we probably don't have a very complete genome. And so our, our genomes were pretty decent in terms of Busco completeness. Here, um, the red here is what we, what we had missing Busco. So that is um, the Buscos that should be there, but are not there. So, you know, like less than 1% uh, or 2%. So we, we, we were confident that we had pretty complete assemblies and that if the virus were, were there, we would find it. And so for the vi virulence genes, as I said, we had the, sequence, the sequences already known from the virus because by isolating the virus and then, and then sequencing these purified viral particles, we knew uh, what those sequences are. So we knew what to look for. And for the replication genes, we knew them from, from one of the, the, the species, from hypozoder. So we searched uh, via, via similarity searches in the genome of Campoletes as well. And here's what we found. So um, here are the virulence genes, the proviral segments, that is the genes that are packaged into the, into the viral particle that is delivered to the wasp, to the, to the host. So here, each of these black lines here is a, a scaffold, a piece of the genome 
you know, we don't have the whole genome assembled because um, that's really hard to do. But we have uh, some really big pieces of the genome. And uh, um, the red uh, traces here, the, head, the red dashes, they are uh, the pieces of the viral genome inside of the wasp genome. So what we see is that it's not that they're not clustered or, or grouped at all. We see them all across the wasp genome, right? We have a piece here, a piece here. Sometimes we, see, we find two in the same um, in the same genome fragment, but look how spread out they are. All of this here in between is wasp genome, is wasp genes. So you know it's kind of interesting because it shows that the um, uh, you know. Kind of, at least some of these genes are moving around because they are also not only they are spread out, but they're also not in the same position across different wasps. So that each of the two wasps has a completely different genomic architecture of these um, viral viral genes. Um, we also did um, fish assays, that is fluorescence in situ hybridization, that showed that um, some of these are even located in different chromosomes. So you know if you don't really you know, have have a hard time believing in, uh, in results when it's just a bunch of code in the computer. You know, seeing some chromosomes um, uh, flashing, it's it's also reassuring. Um, on the other hand, the replication machinery, the the Eves birth, they were much more conserved. So here, what we have is the two genomes of the two viruses, and these are the replication genes uh, of each of the uh, of each of the two viruses associated with the wasps, and you can see that they're seem to be more or less in the same order uh, across their clustered in only um, four different regions. And they seem to be more or less in the same order across the two different species of wasps. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a considerable contrast between the, the proviral genes, that is the, the, the virulence genes that are spread out all across the genome and in different parts. And these ones, which seem to be clustered and located uh, more or less um, in the same order across the two wasps. And if you think about the um, the roles that these two viral um, uh, viral genes um, uh, play in the in 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 evolution and ecology of these groups, it makes sense, right? You have vi virulence genes that are uh, the genes that. Uh, uh, that interact directly with the immune system of the host, these, they need to be fine-tuned to the host physiology, right? Because they are the ones that directly will influence the host development and immune system. And so it makes sense that these would be rapidly evolving because they have to be, you know, specific to each host of these wasps. Whereas the replication machinery, um, it's the original um, replication Set of set of replication genes that were inherited from the ancestral virus, and so they didn't really have to change much because their function is conserved. They're still doing the same thing, which is just replicating viruses, and so it makes sense that they would have um, conserved structure and gene content. So it's pretty interesting. It's pretty cool to see these um, things being consistent with what they they should be, sort of in evolutionary terms. So these results were published some time ago at uh, BMC Biology. Uh, go check out the paper if you if you'd like. Um, and as you can see, this is pretty kind of hardcore genetics, more focused on the um, properties of the viruses themselves and how they're distributed in the genome of the wasp. But as I was talking to you yesterday, I'm not really a geneticist or a virologist. I'm more of a systematist. So what I'm really interested in is um, the sort of evolutionary history that we can derive from these um, viral interactions. So I'm interested, for example, in the phylogenetic distribution of polydenoviruses, right? Those um, viral particles with the DNA inside them. Because look how interesting. They are found in two subfamilies of ichneumonas. They're found in Bankine and Campoplegine. Um, but these two groups, they're not sister groups. They are, you know, um, separate by a bunch of other intervening groups, uh, other lineages that don't seem to have polydenoviruses. So um, that would suggest, for example, um, separate origins for the, for these two um, for these two uh, viral associations. But on the other hand, the viruses are pretty similar, and the Eve spurs, the replication machinery, it's similar between the two. So either they evolved only once and uh, we're lost in some of these other ones, or maybe they are there and we haven't found them because, for example, because most of these other groups have been sparsely sampled. There have been some efforts to see if they have uh, viruses or not, but uh, it hasn't been that consistent. So either these two evolved one time and were lost in some of these groups or something like that, or they evolved separately, but from very similar sets of viruses. You know, we're still trying to understand how these things um, uh, work. 
And it gets even more complicated when we think about, for example, the case of Venturia canescens, the one species in ichneumonids that is known to have virus-like particles. So this is a Campopla genus. So in theory, it should have polydenoviruses, but it doesn't. It doesn't. Instead, it has virus-like particles with no DNA. Um, and so a study by Pichon and others in 2015 also sequenced the, the genes involved in the replication of these viral virus-like particles and find out that they are also derived from anudiviruses like braconids. So here's the gene, here's the, um, the virus from the Venturia canescens. And you can see that it's also in, in, inserted inside of the nudivirus clade, but in a different group from braconid. Uh, viruses. So it's a different group of nudiviruses that is also recruited to make these virus-like particles. So, you know, you can see that the, the, the scenario is, is quite a bit more complex than what we thought. So what, um, what the researchers working in this group have hypothesized was, well, this group should have polydenoviruses because they're Campopla giants, but they don't. Um, so they thought, well, maybe, you know, like it lost the original virus and then, and then gained the the alpha nu the associate with the alpha nu virus uh, making the the virus like particle and this was backed up by um, them finding in the genome of Venturia canescens uh, sequences that seem to be remnants of uh, genes from the polydenovirus the, they're called repeat element genes or rep these are genes that are present in the polydenovirus but that have unknown function we don't know what they do what these genes do yet. And so because they found sequences of these genes, they thought, well, then it makes sense, right? Probably it's a Campopla giant. So it originally had the virus and then it was lost at some point in time and replaced by these virus-like particles. So all this is very interesting, but you know, like we wanted we want to sequence more things and more species and, and, and see if that would help us to put some more resolution in the phylogenetic history of these um, viral associations. So how do we find out if a species has or not DDEs? Uh, so we can go ahead and dissect the ovaries of the, the, that wasp and then do electronic microscopy to see if we find actually the virus particles, if we can see them. We can do some clever uh, proteomics or transcriptomes um, techniques to see if um, um, the, vir the viral genes are being expressed in the ovaries of the wasp. All of these are super complex, you know. Well, the sections are not super complex, but they depend on finding the, 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 the wasp alive and so on. And these proteomics and transcriptomics um, assays are pretty challenging. And so as I was saying yesterday, nowadays it's getting pretty damn cheap to sequence the whole genome at once. So, um, so this has been a, a strategy that the brute force strategy that, that we've been thinking it would be quite useful to do. And so the, the aim of this project was to combine phylogenetic history and whole genome sequencing to understand the, the evolution of DVEs in ichneumonids. So as I was also saying on, on Tuesday, I been working a lot on, on phylogenomics of ichneumonids. At this point, we have a, a, a tree based on, on genomic data with over 100, 800 species from all of the subfamilies. Um, as we can see here, we see the Bankaini and the Campoplegiani in that, in that tree. I mean, we already knew that uh, Bankines and Campoplegiani were not, were not um, sister groups, right? So we confirmed it here, but that, that was, wasn't really big news. What is really interesting about this phylogeny is because it has an unprecedented amount of taxa in it. And so it really allows, allows us to look at a fine tune um, uh, in the internal phylogeny of each of each subfamily. That is, we don't, we don't, we're not looking only at the position between Bankine and Campoplegini, but we can look at the internal phylogeny of each of these two subfamilies. And so I've been quite busy sequencing genomes, uh, finding live wasps, putting them in liquid nitrogen, uh, extracting DNA and sequencing and so forth. So, so far we've sequenced um, short read data for 114 or 14 species, that is um, Illumina Nova seq data at anything between 20 and 100x coverage. So, you know, in some cases, pretty deep coverage of the genome. And for eight species, we were also able to do um, nanopore sequencing that can generate really, really long reads up to 1 million base pairs in length that will, that allow us to really get longer assemblies and understand uh, the structure of the genome a, a bit better. But so far, I'm only going to present a subset of these results because we're still doing a bunch of analysis and so on. Um, so first, I decided to just look closely specifically at the Campoplegini and the Bankaini we have in, in our data set. So what I'm going to present now is just a, a subset of the results for the short read assemblies for 24 species, 14 Campoplegini, 7 Bankaini, and 3 outgroup taxa. And one thing that I was pretty 
that annoyed me a bit when I started to get the results of the genome sequencing was that the genome assemblies were super fragmented. Um, the N50s, uh, that is the kind of like middle point of the size of the fragments of the assemblies were uh, varying from um, 1,600 to 74,000 uh, base pairs with a mean of 20,000. That's not a lot. In, um, in the previous projects that we had, our N50s were like 1 million base pairs, right? So, because that's what we want. You want most of the DNA in your assemblies to be located in long contexts, in long fragments, because then you can look uh, at uh, where the different fragments are located. You can see if you have um, WASP uh, genome flanking each of the viral elements and so on. Um, but here we didn't get it because we were only dealing with short read sequence with standard um, library preps that didn't allow us to get very complete assemblies. The longest contig of all was 670 base pairs, so smallest than the N50 of the other uh, genome sequencing projects we had. So uh, I thought, well, is, is it like even worth doing something? Are we going to be able to get any information from these highly fragmented assemblies? So the first thing I did was, again, go back to Buskul's. That is, uh, we have this set of genes that should be present in all species of insects. So do we find them in our species. And what we, fought, we found was that they, on average, we found over 90% of the buscos, at least uh, partially, right? Here in blue are the complete ones, and in orange are the fragmented ones, and in, uh, and in red, the missing ones. So you can see that for most species, we have the vast majority of the, of the buscos, right? So that indicates that our genomes are pretty complete. Um, we have a couple species where most of the, a, a large portion of the buscos are fragmented, but at least they're there. And we have one species where we have really a lot of them missing. So a really bad assembly with not like not the whole genome complete. So it's okay. This was encouraging. I thought, well, at least we have most of the, the, the genes that should be there. So it means that we can start looking for these viral, um, viral sequences in the, in the wasps. Um, so what we did was that we compared open reading frames from our new assemblies to um, the both kinds of protein of, of, of proteins that we have in uh, in campoplegine wasps. That is the, the virulence genes and the replication genes. We looked at both of them, uh, and also to the new virus genes that we find in Venturi acanescens. That is the genes from the virus-like particle. So we were looking both for the polydna viruses, the type of um, viral element with DNA inside it, and also for um, uh, virus-like particles. That is the, the the viruses without without DNA. Um, so what we expected to find more or less was that, you know, in the literature, it's kind of more or less assumed, again, that these associations evolved at the base of each subfamily. And then so all of the Bankini should have the, the, the polydnoviruses and all of the Campoplegini should have them. And that the outgroup shouldn't have them, right? That was kind of like our expectations. And this was more or less confirmed, but not quite. So it's pretty interesting. Um, here's the little phylogeny of the genomes that, uh, I'm that I've analyzed and I'm showing you here is 24 species. So in blue here, we have the Bankine. And um, here on this column here, the purple ones is the Ivspurs, that is the replication genes that indicate the presence of, um, of polydnoviruses. And we see that we found them in most species of Bankine, but not all. So Bancus vitosus, which is the sister to all other um, species, don't have them. So it seems that these group, the, the, this association with virus didn't evolve at the base of the Bankini tree, but only in a subset of its species. For Campoplegini, what we saw was that we have two main clades. This clade, I think I, yeah, I have some notes. Okay. So this clade here, which I'm going to call group A, has no Ivspurs, that is, it has no polydnoviruses. Here, you see this column here is all blank. Um, but, and this group B does have polynoviruses. So what we thought was once spread across the whole family, now we can see that it's probably, it seems to be only restricted to a single clade, to um, one part of the of the subfamily and not all of them. And within group A, the group that doesn't have Ivspurs, we found at least three species with nudiviral genes, that genes that indicate the presence of virus-like particles. Remember, these were only known from one species, only from Venturia canescens. And now we're finding them in different genera where in, in that clade of, um, of Campoplegine, right? So these are, these are pretty interesting discoveries because they kind of go against what, what we were thinking. And having the phylogenetic information here also makes a lot of difference. So here are, this phylogeny here only shows the genomes that we have, right? But what we can do is we can insert these genomes that we have in the phylogeny, the UCE phylogenomic um, tree that I have 
to kind of like get a sense of how these things are related and, 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 and how these, where did these viral associations appear? So here, for example, you see Bancus vitosus. This is the species that doesn't have um, uh, uh, polynaviruses. So it's it's inside of this whole tribe that is called the tribe Bankini. So it probably indicates that the, all of the all of the group, you know, all, all of the species in this tribe don't have the virus yet, and that the viral association only appeared at some point here. So we have three candidate nodes nodes here to where this could have evolved because we all of the species in this clade here seem to have them, but then we have these two species here that haven't been sampled. So we could. It could be that evolved that the association involved here or here or here, right? So, um, so under you know having the phylogeny also indicates to us what are the next species, what are the candidate species that we need to sequence next to keep understanding to you know keep growing understanding of this project. If I come here and I sequence a bunch of these species, I'll probably get information that I already know. So now I'm going to get my hands in the species of Pantelis and Saclabinia to sequence them and see do these uh, have the virus as well or not. And in Campo Pelagini, the same thing. We're here, we're inserting the, the genomes that we have, which are here in, 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 in um, yellow font and bold, into the phylogeny with the ultra-conserved uh, data, the, the ultra-conserved elements. So these species in white, we don't have the, 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 the genomes for. Um, and again, you see that none of these has, um, here on this clade here, none of them have, has uh, polydenoviruses, uh, but at least some of them have new viruses. Uh, that is uh, virus-like particles, which were only known so far from one from one species. So here we have Venturia, the species that were originally the group that was originally known to have them, and here we have you know other groups that seem to also have evolved. So it seems that instead of evolving in only one group, it evolved in in a in a large um, in a large subset of of Campo Pelagini. And here we what we have is the species that that have the polydenoviruses that were once assumed to be present more or less in all Campo Pelagines. But we see that they're only in a specific group. And again, we have some candidate places to where this association could have evolved um, or not. And some next um, next uh, target species to sequence. Right. So, yeah, so just the different kinds of um, viruses found in each of these groups. So it's pretty interesting that in the same subfamily, you would see two separate events from separate groups of viruses. You know, it's, it's pretty, um, pretty unexpected. Uh, and it goes against um, uh, this um, hypothesis that I just showed you. Go, goes against what we what we had uh, before, right? So the people who had sequenced the genome of Venturia canescens had hypothesized that actually um, Venturia had lost the um, the, the polydenovirus and acquired the the, the virus-like particle. And when they did the, that hypothesis, that made sense because before we didn't have any good phylogenies for ichneumonids. So the only phylogenetic information they had was this little tree here, the generated from a single gene from 28S ribosomal RNA information. And in this tree, you see Venturia canescens was placed here. Um, so nested within a group that contains a lot of species that have polydenoviruses. So all of these marked here are known to have polydenoviruses. So it would make sense that if it's a sort of like species inside of this clade full of species with polydenoviruses, the only explanation would be to, for it to have lost the virus. But now we see that that phylogeny wasn't very accurate and that a, a more complete phylogeny shows us Venturia here in a clade totally separate from the species that have the viruses. So again, I think this is a nice example of how systematics, how phylogenetics can inform these um, otherwise very hardcore genetics, genomics, virology uh, uh, hypothesis, right? Thinking about this in a sort of, from the point of view of the wasps, so to speak, instead of from the point of view of the viruses. Um, and um, another interesting, and again, their thought was not only based on, on the phylogeny, but also on the fact that they found these genes, these repeat element genes that are found inside of the polydenoviruses in the, in the fragments of DNA that are found inside the polydenoviruses. But then when we looked for these um, uh, genes that are inside of the polydenoviruses as well, we found that a lot of them are found you know, all, all over the place. So we have these groups, these two families of genes called vancarines and vinexins. Uh, that are vir virulence proteins. They help to just uh, deal with the immune system of the host. And we see that actually, we see them all across, you know, um, the tree, even in the out groups that have no, no association with viruses at, at all. And likewise, we also find RAP genes uh, in some of the species that don't have either um, virus-like particles or, um, or, um, uh, or polydenoviruses. 
So this indicates, and also other families, gene families of proviral origin, um, that is um, gene families that are found in the virus, um, they're, not also, they're also in, in groups that don't have the, the viral particle. So that indicates that a lot of the genes that are inside of the polynovirus particle were origi originally WASP genes that were repurposed uh, to be put in the virus and delivered, in, delivered into the host. So it makes sense that you would find them even in species that don't have the virus. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, just to finish off, um, we mapped polynovirus insertions in the whole genome of two species. Uh, we found that proviral segments, that is the virulence genes, and, um, and the viral machinery have different genomic architecture uh, in these two species. We confirmed that uh, at least some of the proviral origins have WASP origin. We found that polynoviruses are restricted to subsets of Bunkini and Campopelagini, and not to the whole, not found in the whole subfamilies, as we had uh, previously imagined. And um, it, there seems to be two separate uh, viral acquisitions in Campoplegini independ independently, and also that virus-like particles that are derived from new viruses are present in a large clade instead of just in one species as, as we thought before. So that's a lot of uh, interesting discoveries just by sequencing, you know, like a few genomes and, and looking at them with, with, um, with some, some clever techniques. Um, so in, in the future, of course, there's a lot of challenges to understand more the evolution of this group and, and how these viral associations occurred. Uh, there's a big limitation, of course, related to genome screening. You know, when we look for viral sequences in the genome, we can only find the things that we already know, right? Because we are using template sequences from viruses to look for, for, for them in the, 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 the WASP genome. But what if we're talking about a virus that nobody has sequenced before? What if we're talking about virus that we don't, viral systems that we don't know yet? We're not gonna find anything. So for these, we really know we really need other techniques such as dissection, proteomics, and so on. Uh, and a uh, 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 next step that uh, we plan to do as well is to look for core genes from other virus uh, families in the in the in these things. So far, we've only been looking at polynoviruses and the virus-like particles that are derived from new viruses. But there's a ton of other um, viral groups that can be associated with with uh, parasitic wasps as well. And you know this again. Um, gives way to some interesting evolutionary questions to think about. You know, as I said, I found it pretty interesting that you have two separate events of viral domestication within Campoplegini. So we can start thinking about questions like, what is it special with Campoplegini? You have a ton of other ecumonids around that have no viruses. So why do we have two independent evolutions of this in Campoplegini? Are they particularly suitable for viral domestication? Is there something in, in their genome structure that makes it more likely? Or is there something in their ecology that makes them need these things more? So all of them uh, very interesting questions for the future. Uh, but the immediate next step, of course, is to uh, keep analyzing more Campoplegian genomes to understand, to fill in the gaps of that phylogeny, understand exactly where this association evolved. Yeah, so that's what I had for today. Um, thank you, and I'll take any questions. Tenemos tiempo para preguntas. That's perfectly clear then. Thank you. I am curious about uh, which ecological aspects of Campylopagina could be related to this um, tendency to be to, to domesticate the virus, or what has been hypothesized or seen in another group with a similar case. Yeah, that's what I'm curious about as well. Um, so Campylopagins, uh, they are coenobiont parasitoids, right? As we were discussing, they lay the egg on the host, and the host keeps feeding it's it's a larva a larval host and it, it keeps feeding and developing while the the, the, the wasp um, larva eats it but they're not the only coenobiont parasitoids there are many other groups that are also do the same thing um, for example you have ophionines which are big um, nocturnal wasps that attack caterpillars as well and lay their eggs in them but they don't seem to have viruses so you know it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting you know because um, they have traits that, you know, that let's say that being a coenobiont seems to be a necessary but not sufficient 
traits to to have them. So I'm really interested in understanding what exactly they're doing. One thing that is interesting, though, is that uh, until recently, we only knew uh, poly, poly DNA viruses or uh, domesticated viral elements from species that attack Lepidoptera. Uh, but then recently, for example, we, one species of Campoplegiani that attacks Coleoptera was found to also have uh, these polydenoviruses, or at least some of the genes associated with polydenoviruses. Um, and then new systems, as I was describing in the beginning of the talk, new systems are being discovered in the past in the recent years, we have a uh, filamentous virus that is associated with the parasitoid of Drosophila. Uh, so it's a totally different family uh, of viruses and totally different way of, of it working. So it doesn't, it's hard to, to see like any clear patterns in, in their ecology. Maybe it's something more related to um, their genome structure or generation time or something like that. Uh, we're still just, just beginning to try to understand that. Alguien más? Thank you very much for your talk, Bernardo. Eh, en español mejor, ¿no? Sí, sí. claro. Eh, Intentamos. ¿qué, ¿Qué grupos de neumónidos sí. eh, son los que faltan por muestrear y que pueden dar pues, más pistas sobre la, la evolución de, 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 de estos virus? En, Bien, este punto ya mostramos, um, ya secuenciamos el ADN de, de una muestra bien larga de, de, lo, de la familia. Tenemos 114 uh, genomas para 114 especies y ahora pienso que casi todas las subfamilias, o al menos las, las más grandes y todo, están, están secuenciadas. Um, no, 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 no dice todo que, que, que hicimos de, de análisis porque algunas cosas son preliminares, pero por ejemplo, tenemos una que los ortocentrine, que son una familia de ignomónidos bien pequeños que parasitan dípteros, y encontramos evidencia para posiblemente un nudivirus en esta. Tenemos un otro que es un, un bicho muy misterioso que no sabemos mismo, el hospedero, y encontramos secuencias similares a la de los um, polidnaviruses, pero como todavía es preliminar, encontramos, toda vez que encontramos los resultados, queremos los confirmar dos, tres veces para, para estar seguros que no hay un, un error, una, una cosa que no, que no se sabe todavía. Pero, pero sí, tenemos una, yo pienso que una vez, después que, que, que analizamos todo lo que ten, tenemos, ten, tendremos una, una muestra muy completa de la familia al menos. ¿Sí? Ahora que dices que encontraron un neumónido eh, que ataca dípteros eh, encontraron un nudivirus también en, bueno, en Braconide encontraron también un, un, en una, sub, una subfamilia en Opine también sí, los opine. Eh, que es que, bueno es un virus like parigo sí pero que también creo que proviene de nudivirus no no, no sé. me recuerdo estaba estaba a punto de mirar antes sí, de, de venir me parece pero... no no estoy seguro pero es interesante ver no cómo Dices que la mayoría de los polinavirus se han encontrado en, en, en grupos que atacan lepidóptera. Sí. Y, sí, y, y luego, no sé, a lo mejor, bueno, son eventos independientes tal vez, pero habría, tal vez habría cierta relación en, en los grupos de virus a los que están asociados con su hospedero. Sí, es posible. Sí, sí es verdad. Pero, pero lo que complica todo es que los ignovirus no sabemos de cuál grupo sí, sí, son sí. originarios. Eso es muy... Muy interesante, que no se parecen con ningún virus que se conoce. ¿Alguien más? Bueno, pues entonces le agradecemos sí. a Bernardo su participación. Ah, gracias. Muchas gracias.